a short video on strokes, also called cerebrovascular accidents, or CVA. I'll be talking about an overview and pathophysiology of strokes. I'll talk about the cause and the risk factors for strokes, the presentation of a stroke in the clinic, the initial workup of a stroke, or how to manage it for the first day or two, and then how to manage it in the long term, the chronic therapy and prevention of subsequent strokes. Here's a picture of an ischemic stroke, specifically an embolic stroke, and I'll be talking about these in the context of pathophysiology on the next slide. Let's get started. So first, an overview of strokes. Strokes are the number three leading cause of death in the United States. Number one is coronary vascular disease, and number two is cancer. Number three is stroke. Strokes are the number one cause of neurologic disability in the United States. So first, let's talk about the pathophysiology of ischemic strokes. There are two big categories, thrombotic and embolic strokes. Thrombotic strokes are similar to what you would have that causes a heart attack. This is atherosclerosis, or a buildup of plaques on the inside of the arteries leading up to your brain. When those build up, it occludes the blood flow and it can prevent blood, sl blood flow. That's a thrombus, an ischemic stroke or a thrombotic stroke. When this happens, you have a blockage in a blood vessel, and the tissue downstream of the blood vessel dies. This is an infarction. So this is an ischemic stroke. It could be either a thrombotic or an embolic stroke. Embolic stroke is when an embolus, or a piece of material, a piece of debris that come from somewhere else in the body, ends up lodged in a blood vessel and occludes blood flow. So again, tissue downstream is going to infarct, is going to die. So that embolic stroke can come from a variety of sources. We'll talk about those on the next slide, but they can come from a heart valve or from atrial fibrillation or even from a DVT in a very specific case. The next big category of strokes is hemorrhagic strokes. Hemorrhagic means bleeding. So this is a bleed into the brain. So when a blood vessel going into the brain breaks or ruptures, you have a leak of blood into the brain tissue. If that leak of blood ends up between the subarachnoid mater and the pia mater, it's a subarachnoid hemorrhage. If the leak of blood is into the parenchymal or ventricular space, it's an intracranial hemorrhage. Here's a CT scan of a hemorrhagic stroke. The blood here shows up more white than the surrounding tissue, and you can see that inside these ventricles and even in the sulci on the outside of the brain, there is blood. So there has been a hemorrhagic stroke in this picture arrows pointing to that in the middle, where normally that would be more clear. Normally that would be a clear fluid. It's now filled with blood. Next, let's talk about the causes and risk factors for strokes. Again, we'll start with ischemic strokes. So ischemic strokes are 85% of all strokes. And as I said earlier, these are similar to heart attacks, but in the brain, in the embolic stroke, this is, let's go back. This, we're talking about the embolic stroke first. So a piece of debris ended up in a blood vessel. A clot forms. There are several places that this clot can form, but in any case, it's thrown to a smaller vessel leading up to the brain. It gets lodged and it occludes blood. Now, where can this clot form? We said it can, it can happen on damaged blood vessels, uh, sorry, on damaged heart valves, including artificial valves. It can form during atrial fibrillation. It can be a piece of carotid stenosis that's thrown up. And in the case of a patent forum ovale, that's the hole between the two ventricles in the heart that happens at birth, a DVT can kind of shoot through from the vein from, from, from the vein system to the artery system and end up in the in the arteries leading up to the brain. So that's how a DVT can end up as an embolic stroke. That's that's worth knowing. Next is the thrombotic stroke, and again the cause, the risk factors are all associated to atherosclerosis. So the same risk factors that can lead to atherosclerosis in the heart. This includes type 2 diabetes hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, smoking, and age. There are other kinds of ischemic strokes. These are less prominent than the embolic and the thrombotic strokes. These include lacunar strokes, which happen in the smaller arteries. There are vasospasms that can cause strokes, and that's similar to the pathophysiology of migraines. Drug abuse, um, aortic dissections, and arteritis can also cause strokes. In younger patients the, who get strokes, the risk factors are more like hypercoagulable states, like patients who use oral contraceptive pills, people with deficiencies in protein CNS, people who use cocaine, amphetamines, patients with polycythemia vera, and patients with sickle cell disease. So if you have a younger patient and you 
find a stroke or they seem to be presenting with a stroke, you might want to look into these things. These might be the risk factors or the causes of that stroke in a young patient. Next big category was hemorrhagic stroke. This is 15% of all strokes, so many more are ischemic than hemorrhagic. Again, the two broad categories of hemorrhagic stroke are subarachnoid hemorrhage and intracranial hemorrhage. These have the worst prognosis. The literature says that a 30-day mortality for a hemorrhagic stroke is between 30 and 50 percent, so that's pretty high, much higher than the ischemic strokes. The cause here is a blood vessel or aneurysm rupture. So a lot of times they have berry aneurysms that rupture, and what usually causes that rupture is hypertension. So hypertension is a major risk factor for a ruptured berry aneurysm, a ruptured blood vessel causing a hemorrhagic stroke. Other risks are trauma and anticoagulation. Next, let's talk about how strokes might present in the clinic. The easiest way to talk about how strokes present is to study the vasculature leading into the brain. So that's called the circle of Willis. It's depicted here with a lot of labels. I'll talk about the labels that matter and um, a little tips for how to, how to remember them. First, let's talk about how subarachnoid hemorrhages present. This has a classic presentation of a thunderclap headache. It's called a thunderclap headache because like thunder, it goes from zero to 100 almost instantaneously. So it goes from no pain to full pain very, very quickly. Some patients describe it as the worst headache of their life or the worst pain in their life. And there's also potentially associated neck stiffness. That's a sign of meningeal irritation. There could also be vomiting. And when you do a lumbar puncture, you might see xanthrochromia. This is when the CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid, on lumbar puncture is a darker yellow color as opposed to the normal clear cerebral spinal fluid. In the case of subarachnoid hemorrhage, it's a darker yellow color because there are byproducts of red blood cells from that brain bleed that's causing the CSF to turn this color in xanthrochromia. The subarachnoid hemorrhages most often happen at these intersections in the circle of Willis. So it's at all these branch points, essentially. The branch point between the circle of Willis and the middle cerebral artery, the anterior communicating arteries and the anterior central arteries, as well as the posterior medial central arteries. So I've kind of labeled them here. These are where the most common ruptures causing subarachnoids happen. Next, I'll talk about how some of these major arteries present when there's a stroke, an ischemic stroke of those, of those arteries. First is the anterior cerebral artery. That's the big one coming up in the front of the brain. This presents as paralysis of the legs and feet and also confusion. Remember that the front of the cerebral cortex is where a lot of your higher order thinking happens. So if you have an infarction here, you can end up with confusion. A stroke of the middle cerebral artery causes paralysis of the face and arms as well as speech. So this is most of the center part of your brain, not the anterior part, not the posterior part, but the middle part of your brain. And that's where the speech centers are. So that's the middle cerebral artery. A good way to remember the ACA and the MCA strokes is by looking at the homunculus. If you remember, this tells you which specific gyri, which specific folds of the brain correspond to which body parts. And if we were gonna label the regions supplied by the ACA and the middle cerebral arteries, the anterior and the middle cerebral arteries, they would be labeled something like that, where the anterior cerebral artery uh, kind of provides blood flow for the legs, the hips, and the feet, whereas the middle cerebral arteries provide blood flow, or sorry, provide blood flow to the areas that provide motor innervation to the rest of the body, the face, the arms, as well as the speech centers. So the middle cerebral artery provides most of that. If you have a stroke of the MCA, you're gonna have paralysis of the face and the arms, if you have a stroke of the ACA, you're going to have paralysis of the toes, the feet, the legs. Another major artery is the posterior cerebral artery. This powers the vision center of the brain, which is typically the back of the brain, the posterior side of the brain. So a PCA stroke leads to impairments in vision. A stroke of the pontine arteries or the basilar arteries can lead to locked-in syndrome. The cerebellum, also in the back of the head, is supplied by several arteries, all called something cerebellar artery. And remember that the cerebellum is all about coordination. So if you have a stroke, a cerebellar stroke, you might have dysdiadokinesia, ataxia, and discoordination. 
Lastly, strokes of the basal layer artery and vertebral artery can lead to syncope as your main presenting symptom. So many, many ways that a stroke can present, and by looking at the exact symptoms and which parts of the body they affect, you can kind of isolate which arteries are affected in that stroke. Next, we'll talk about the initial workup. This is what you do in the first day or two of stroke presentation. The first test you want to do when a stroke is suspected is a CT scan without contrast. Now this without contrast is pretty important because if there's a subarachnoid hemorrhage or a hemorrhagic stroke in general, you don't want to get contrast um, all over the brain. So if on a CT scan without contrast you see blood, that means that you have a hemorrhagic stroke, which again was 15% of all strokes. Blood on the CT scan would show up as white, as in that picture we showed a, a few slides back. So it should be pretty easy to identify a hemorrhagic stroke on a CT scan without contrast. Another reason to not have the contrast is that the contrast also shows up white on a CT scan. So you don't want to mix this up with the potential blood of a hemorrhagic stroke. In any case, if you do see blood on a CT scan, you have a hemorrhagic stroke and you want to immediately consult neurosurgery, which would then be able to coil or clip the bleed. There's data that shows that coiling is better than clipping, and you can also do coiling through intravascular means, which is nice. In the case of hemorrhagic stroke, you want to reduce your blood pressure to below 150 systolic. This makes sense. If you're bleeding into the brain, you want to reduce the blood pressure to prevent the amount of blood that ends up in the brain. You want to give fresh frozen plasma to help the body clot that bleed. You can prevent hydrocephalus with a shunt or with recurrent lumbar punctures or even craniotomy. This will kind of reduce the pressure in the brain, uh, prevent hyper hydrocephalus. You can also prophylax for seizures using anticonvulsants, and you want to prevent vasospasms of the other blood vessels in the brain with calcium channel blockers. Next, if you don't have blood, then you don't have a hemorrhagic stroke, you have an ischemic stroke. And the next step is to consider TPA, or tissue plasminogen activator. This is a chemical that can break the clot and save the penumbra. The penumbra is the region of brain tissue surrounding the infarct. So the infarct is the region of dead brain tissue. The penumbra is the region of brain tissue surrounding the dead brain tissue. And the penumbra is at risk of dying um, upon presentation. So if you have a chance, you might be able to break the clot and save more brain tissue from dying. You might have a chance of saving the penumbra. There are a few important caveats to using TPA. The first is that the patient must present within 3 to 4.5 hours of definite symptom onset. This means that their stroke must have happened within 3 hours of their presentation. So if they were asleep, for instance, and they woke up with stroke symptoms and they were asleep all night, you don't know when their stroke symptoms started. So you are not able to say that their stroke started within 3 hours. If they, on the other hand, all of a sudden had paralysis on one side of the body or had vision changes in one eye, you might be able to say the stroke definitely happened one hour ago. So that's why it's important to uh, specify that this is definite symptom onset. And the 3 to 4.5 kind of just depends on which study you're looking at. There's decent evidence for up to 4.5 hours of use. Um, the, or the original recommendation was only 3 hour time window. Um, you still only use three hours for diabetics, so it's kind of one of these two numbers. Um, to be on the safe side, only use TPA if it's within three hours. There are other contraindications to TPA. The person has to have had no head trauma and no surgery within the past 21 days, and the person can never have had a brain bleed in the past. The TPA breaks clots, but can also cause bleeding into the brain. So if somebody presents with an ischemic stroke and you're considering TPA, you want to make sure that you're not going to cause a subarachnoid hemorrhage. You want to make sure you're not going to cause a hemorrhagic stroke on top of that ischemic stroke. So you don't want to use it in people that had a head trauma, that had surgery in the past 21 days, and that people that have had a history of a brain bleed. And you only want to use it within 3 or 4.5 hours of definite symptom onset. Later, once you've done that CT scan without contrast and you've considered TPA, there's some other things to work up. The blood pressure is something you want to keep an eye on. You can allow for permissive hypertension with an ischemic stroke unless they've had TPA. So if it's a hemorrhagic stroke, you're definitely not going to have permissive hypertension. Permissive hypertension is allowing their blood pressure to go up pretty high, up to systolic 200 or systolic 220 even, something that you normally would not be okay with, but in the case of an ischemic stroke, you do allow it because the high blood pressure 
is the body's response to get some blood past that ischemia, past that blood uh, vessel that's been blocked in the brain. Of course, if you're giving TPA and the person has a risk of bleeding now because they get TPA, you don't want to do permissive hypertension. And if the person has a hemorrhagic stroke, you also don't want to do permissive hypertension. So that's something to keep an eye on. Control the blood pressure in the cases of hemorrhagic stroke and in the cases of ischemic stroke when you give TPA. Have permissive hypertension when it's, when it's an ischemic stroke with no TPA given. You'll also do an EKG to look for atrial fibrillation. If there is atrial fibrillation, you pretty soon need to start some anticoagulation such as warfarin or these novel oral anticoagulants like apixaban, dabigatran, and rivaroxaban. In this case of atrial fibrillation, you don't need a heparin bridge for anticoagulation. You also want to do an echo of the heart. This allows you to check the cardiac valves. You'll, you'll also maybe see AFib on echocardiography of the heart, and this will give you the source of the embolism if it was an embolic stroke. Lastly, you want to do carotid duplex ultrasound, essentially looking at the carotid arteries and see how uh, much they were stenosed. If they were stenosed by 80% or if they were stenosed by 70% and the patient has symptoms, then that earns them a carotid stent or a, or a carotid end arterectomy. So you want to fix that stenosis in the carotid arteries if they're very, very occluded. Lastly, let's talk about the chronic therapy for future stroke prevention. In general, these people need quite a bit of medications to prevent future strokes and to keep them healthy for the rest of their lives. Blood pressure needs to be maintained with a systolic less than 140 and a diastolic less than 80. Several agents can achieve this, including ACE inhibitors, diuretics, and others. Hyperlipidemia needs to be addressed. Somebody who's had a stroke automatically gets a high-intensity statin, that's a torvastatin at 40 or 80 milligrams, or resuvastatin at 20 or 40 milligrams. Patients with diabetes need to maintain their A1C below 7%. This is usually achieved with metformin and diet and lifestyle. If that doesn't work, you can use other oral agents for reducing your A1C or even insulin. Smoking cessation for everyone all the time, especially people who have had strokes. People who have had strokes also need antiplatelets for life. They can use aspirin, and if they can't use aspirin, they can use clopidogrel. You can also add dipyrimidol for this, antiplatelets for life. Lastly, anticoagulants for life. So people who have had strokes need warfarin or one of those NOACs that we listed on the previous slide. In fact, the, CHAD, the CHADS2 VASC score tells you if you need anticoagulation. And the recommendation is that if you meet at least two of these criteria, you get anticoagulants for life. Stroke on this list actually counts for two points. So stroke or a TIA or a thromboembolism automatically gets you anticoagulation according to the CHADS2 score. So people who have had strokes definitely need anticoagulation. This has been a brief overview of strokes of cerebrovascular accidents. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.